Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining the webinar. We're just going to give everyone a couple more minutes to hop on. So appreciate you being on time and we will start in just a few minutes. Before we get started, I also want to point out that we have a Q&A box. So as we give the presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them into the Q&A section and we will address them at the end of the presentation if we have time. So I encourage you to be interactive. If there's a specific thing that you want us to delve into, let us know and we will address them then. All right, so should we kick it off, guys? All right, let's go. Um, thank you all so much for joining. Um, we are delighted to be joined by our friend and favorite client, Francois Valarien. Did I say that right in my French my French accent? Uh, he's Indeed, the vice but president. I'll say it better. <laughs> right. Uh, he's the vice president of research at CBS uh, Viacom, Viacom CBS Global Distribution Group. Um, and he's here to share with us a little bit more about how he uses viewership data and how we can leverage our new YouGov stream data um, to talk to more talk to you more about what how to leverage viewership data. So we're super excited to have you, Francois. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Hamish, take it away. Tell us a little bit about our newest product, YouGov Safe. Hi. Um, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm just going to start with a little bit of background about how the stream data set came around and also the broader applications um, that it has for the market research industry, for the entertainment industry, and um, potentially every consumer and user of data globally, we hope. Um, so over the last six or seven months, we've been building a new product um, we call YouGov Safe that allows our members, so YouGov's panelists and members who traditionally fill in surveys and have built up according to Pew Research, one of the richest data sets of self-reported data globally. Um, and so we have built this tool, YouGov Safe, that actually allows our members to go beyond just filling in surveys, but connect their own data, which third party companies and corporations and organizations may hold about them. Um, and one of these obviously is very interesting, um, or possibly the most interesting, um, if you're in the entertainment business and in LA, as, as I am, for example, is, is your things like your viewership data, your Netflix data, what you watch on Netflix, what you watch on Amazon. So this is data that these companies have about you. Um, and we are able to help our members share that data with us directly. And as the whole ethos behind SAFE is that it empowers our members to securely, in a consent driven way, share data sets with us that I'm going to sort of talk about a bit more in the next slide, um, and also get remunerated and paid for your data. Um, and that's so the sort of the two key ethos is that sort of consent driven manner and get paid for your data across multiple different data sets. And then we uniquely at YouGov can do very, very interesting things and build products off of this data that basically helps monetize, uh, incentivize the panelists and provide real value. And one of the first things that we have built is this product YouGov Stream that Ali and Francois are gonna talk about that I think is really exciting. And just before we get to that, just to sort of give you an idea of the types of data that we, our members are already sharing with us, um, is not only viewer, you know, your, your streaming data, but your browsing history, um, your Amazon shopping cart, 
um, your streaming, so your Spotify listening history, your YouTube history, your search history. Um, and we're adding more and more over the next couple of months, things like your Instacart history, your Etsy history, your Walmart history. So these aren't, um, and so on and so forth. So these aren't things that are necessary, and banking uh, data as well. Um, and these aren't things that are necessary, what you're doing on a particular browser, but what you as a user is connecting to your accounts that has data about you on lots of different devices. Um, it's currently live in the US and the UK, and we're basically expanding into a bunch of other markets very, very rapidly over the next um, three to six months with our primary next step markets being uh, the FIG, so France, Italy, Germany, and Spain. And on that note, I will hand it over to the far more intelligent and talented uh, teammates, Ali and client, Francois. Sorry, I didn't realize I'm muted. Thanks, Hamish. Um, so just backing up before we get into stream and the nitty gritty, I think, um, especially for our clients on this webinar and, and partners and collaborators who are interested in data that isn't just about streaming viewership, I want to talk about how we're using the other data sources um, and how we're incorporating that in custom bespoke projects currently. Um, so we've been getting a lot of inquiries from clients about this new product. Marketing's done a fantastic job of promoting it. So we're really excited about all this interest. Um, so we just sort of wanna walk you through the process of how you might be able to leverage this data in these early alpha stages. So first we get an inquiry from a client, particularly um, around a particular cohort analysis. So let's say they are a bank and they wanna learn more about how many, who's visiting their website, um, what's the demographic makeup of them? What are all the different variables about them? And more information in terms of how they can uh, target specific groups if they haven't converted them to customers. Um, perhaps they just want to learn more about different demographic groupings and what they're doing online. So this is all examples of leveraging Chrome browser history. However, let's say they're a music company and they want to look into um, what people are streaming and um, what we're capturing from the Spotify perspective. Um, so these are all definitions that we can start with and data sources we can start with. We then transition to giving you analysis on each one of these defined cohorts. So basically defining cohort A as an age group, for example, we can provide you more deeper insights about that particular group. And we do that across the defined cohorts. We then can go into what we define as the three R's. Um, I literally like this because it's a great way to summarize how you can do an ongoing projects. You can either add more data sources or simply change the data source and give you more information about each cohort and simply repeat the process. You can also run a recontact study. So part of the reason that this is so unique to YouGov and so interesting for a lot of our clients is that we can maybe start with Chrome browser history, define a segment based on behavioral data, and then run a custom study on that cohort. Um, so you can start to ask them qualitative questions. Maybe you want to run a more qualitative moderated focus group with that group. There's all sorts of opportunities we can do to leverage the YouGov survey mechanisms at that point. And then lastly, you can always increase the sample size uh, to get your cohort defini definitions even more refined. So perhaps you're looking for a very specific type of segmentation. Um, we can do that simply by increasing the amount of people that are giving us the data. So we're really excited about this project, um, this product. So if you have any particular bespoke projects that you're interested in, definitely reach out to us. Well, let's dive into what YouGov Stream is. So as Hamish said, it's the first data product that's actually come out of the YouGov safe data. And it contains entirely SVOD data across many platforms. Um, and it is housed in our existing YouGov Signal platform. For those of you on the call who don't know what Signal is, it's essentially a dig digital diagnostic tool where we track every single TV show, film, brand, um, actor, anything our clients want us to track. And we track multiple digital analytic uh, KPIs across various data sources. Now we've actually included a viewership metric as the newest KPI. And therefore this data is housed really nicely within that app because we can append this viewership data with a tremendous amount of metadata and IMDB tags and all sorts of genre tags that we've already collected on these individual shows. Um, so we're collecting these raw viewership files, we're processing them and then putting them into the YouGov Signal platform. Um, right now, as Hamish said, the data that's available is in U US and UK. I do have a roadmap at the end of this, um, but we will have many different data sources shortly. 
Uh, the anticipated sample size is around 300,000 with, with 100,000 of those individuals being in the United States and 200,000 being outside of the United States. Um, ultimately, you'll be able to compare and contrast cross-platform viewership data on a global scale. That's really where we're going with this tool and we're super excited about it. So what is the purpose of this uh, webinar is really to explore how this viewership data can sort of behave in the context of uh, current digital tracking, um, looking at OTT performance, bench benchmarking this data, and also verify platform growth as of course, uh, Viacom CBS just launched uh, Paramount Plus, and of course, that's incredibly useful uh, for, for Francois. So Francois, before we dive into the data, tell me a little bit more about who you are and what you do at CBS and uh, a little bit about your background. Sure. Hi, everyone. And thank you, Ali. And thank you, Hamish, for having me uh, today, for inviting me to speak. I hope you guys are all as excited as I am to go through this 12-hour presentation. Uh, but since I speak very fast, I'll do it in just 12 minutes. <laughs> My name is Valerian. I've been working in television research for 16 years, so basically since the pre-iPhone era, which makes me an old person in the industry. I'm basically a TV OG, uh, and I started my career in France. You might have guessed it, it's in my name, Francois, uh, <laughs> and I can hide my accent anyway. So <laughs> I started working in content research at uh, MCS, a free TV network, during four years. Uh, that's when I was a baby. And then I joined the global production group Zodiac Media during six years. Zodiac since uh, merged with Bunny J a few years ago. I moved to the beautiful and sunny city of Los Angeles with Zodiac in 2014. And I joined 20th Century Fox Television Distribution for three years after that. Do you guys remember uh, that studio? Uh, I was very happy then to join CBS um, right before the merger with Disney. Uh, and now CBS is Viacom CBS. Uh, it's been almost three years that I'm the VP of research for the global distribution group. Um, so I think that at this point, I might be merger proof. So bring it on. I <laughs> don't want another merger. Please don't stop the mergers now. <laughs> now that everyone knows my resume. We can get into the topic of the day, which is not my bio. Uh, I know I can see your sad faces, um, but it's <laughs> Promise we're going to have a very good time in the next 11 minutes. Today, I'm here to speak about the challenges that we are facing as content distributors to understand the true viewership and therefore the true value of our content. And our first observation is that the demand for video content is at a peak and it keeps growing. Video is a trending topic in life. Technology allows us to watch video anywhere, anytime, in any format, and it works. People watch it. But it's no secret, linear TV has been on the decline for the past years. However, in 2020, the unexpected happened again and again, and linear TV consumption surged in 77% of the territories, which is crazy. Daily consumption of linear TV increased by six minutes a day on average in the world. News channels were heavily consumed, of course, but not only because entertainment programming and virtually every general entertainment channel grew significantly with all viewers and with young adults. And young adults, who, by the way, discovered that the TV screen also offered television and is not just a big computer screen to plug their PlayStation. In Italy, for example, 2020 was the year where people watched the most TV of all time. 28 minutes more than in 2019, it sounds crazy. Um, it's huge and it's never, it's unheard of. It never happened before. In the US though, according to Nielsen, adults spend five hours and 21 minutes a day watching video content uh, in Q3 2020. Uh, most of that consumption is in front of the TV screen, but young adults now spend more time streaming content, whether it's on their TV, on their smartphone, on their tablet, than watching actual linear TV but older demographics after 35 years old still like linear TV better than streaming on any other device. The counterpart of the decline of linear TV is that OTT usage is exploding. Right now, there's 230 million OTT users in the US, which is roughly three quarters of the population. Um, YouTube is the most used service with 219 million regular users. Sounds crazy that some people don't use YouTube. I mean, with all the, the tutorials that they are there, you could basically know everything on YouTube. 
Um, but also Netflix is very used with 175 million uh, active users. In the UK, that trend also exists because right now, 45 million people, which is 66% of the population, use OTT services. 10 years ago, that was zero. The usage of streaming platform doubled in France within a year. Uh, in France, Netflix is very popular, which is crazy because it's a pay service. And in France, we don't like to pay for anything. Uh, so it's a really great success for them. Consumption uh, also increased in Norway by 49%, which is enormous because Norway is known to be a very mature market uh, in, in Europe and the rest in, outside of the US, uh, where 80% of young adults use uh, OTT services, services regularly. So content is used across all platforms, uh, but the usage is very difficult to capture. And the first challenge we have to monitor the usage is to have access to consistent and true viewership data. The issue that we have now is that tier ratings don't cover the whole story. I love tier ratings, don't get me wrong. Uh, they are essential, they are an essential part of our business. And according to me, they are the most essential part of the business, of course, because my job depends on that data. They're still extremely relevant today. Uh, we, use it, we use them every day, but they don't cover the whole story. In the US, we're able to understand the linear consumption very precisely thanks to Nielsen and some of the non-linear consumption with Nielsen and Comscore. Let's take the example of a random selected show like NCIS, which is, by the way, uh, one of the most popular shows in the world, if not the most popular drama in the world. We can establish that the viewership of first-run episodes on CBS um, is, uh, is pretty big, is what it is, um, and it's very precise. But surprise, it actually represents a small portion of the total viewership of NCIS uh, in the US. The second surprise is that reruns on cable and syndication seem to represent the biggest chunk of the viewership. But however, and no surprise there, the streaming consumption of NCIS is incomplete. Nielsen can provide us an idea of the viewership on Netflix, but they are missing pieces. Since the series is available on multiple uh, platforms, uh, which are not monitored and do not share their performance. And since the viewership on streaming is incremental and possibly unlimited, uh, it's likely that we are missing a large part of the picture and maybe even the largest part. And that's in the US where streaming measurement is somewhat advanced, but internationally, it's virtually impossible to understand the true viewership of content. And that's a real problem for us. The new reality that we're facing is that US series premiere more and more on OTT platforms. Uh, as an example, in Spain, 66% of new US scripted series premiered on non-linear platforms, which means that there's only one third of new series that premiere on linear platforms, meaning that we can only get performance review for one third of the series. In Sweden, the number is 42% that premiered on OTT platforms. And even in Germany, a very traditional market, only now 33% of new series premiere on OTT platforms. And that trend is accelerating in most territories. So because of that, we're facing brand new challenges. The first one is that there is no legit measurement for OTT platforms. I have no idea what's going on there. The second one is that there is no standard methodology across countries. Nielsen in the US uses a panel to measure SVOD consumption on some selected services. While Mediametry in France conducts daily phone, inter phone interviews to ask viewers about their streaming consumption. So it's two very different methods with slightly different degrees of precision, uh, we could say that. The third challenge is that there is no global currency for streaming. In TV, we use average audience per minute, but on streaming, there's multiple different metrics that we can use. Some, some companies use views, they use um, unit viewers, minutes viewed, view through, and all these metrics are great, they're valid, but the companies don't even have the same definition for these metrics. Uh, so there is no measurement possible across these platforms. And last but not least, there is no comprehensive reporting from streamers who have the real consumption data. And now we're going to ask, why is it so important that we know the performance of our IP? Well, you know, for me, it's very important. It's even vital because I need to keep my job. So if I don't have data, I don't have a job. Also, it's fundamental in order to determine the future of IP. Uh, data helps us providing feedback to content creators and helps them uh, develop successful series. We, we want to be able to sell the right content to the right platform, whether it's linear, AVOD, SVOD, BVOD, FreeVOD. Um, we want all our clients to encounter success with our titles, of course. 
Um, so we want to know what is adapted to their platform. And for that, we have to be able to pick which titles are going to work for them, knowing what works for them already on their platform. But if we don't have this information, we are very limited in what we can offer them. We can just imagine. Um, and also, uh, data, uh, the, the point of all that, of course, is to help our client gain viewers and subscribers. Um, data is also necessary to price the content at its right value. Um, of course, if it works well, it needs to be paid more. Um, and knowing and being able to analyze performance in detail is a win-win, win-win for OTT platforms, for their subscribers, for content owners, and of course, for me. But when the information is not available, that's when we have to be creative. Uh, and that's when a service like Bugov Signal has, came, has come very handy uh, in the past years. We've been subscribing to Signal for two years. Um, it has been allowing us to fill the streaming gap and also understand performance of linear titles beyond viewership. It's a very good proxy for viewership, but that's not only the, the point. Um, it allows really for a full competitive analysis. Uh, there's thousands of titles available on Signal. We can compare our titles to our competitors on the same platform or across platform or in the same universe or even across universes like streaming or linear. For example, if we have a title premiering on a streaming platform in a particular country, we're able to compare it to all of the streaming titles in this particular territory. We can also monitor the week-to-week -week appeal of our titles uh, as well as the chatter on social media uh, that is generated by uh, our titles and by competitive titles. We get very unique information about the potential of a series prior to its release, uh, but also outside of its broadcast window. And this is really, really great uh, when we want to evaluate the potential of a title domestically or internationally while it has not aired yet, um, or even before a new season is launched. We also get to track franchises as a whole, uh, and we have a lot of franchises, uh, Star Trek, CSI, NCIS. Uh, so we, we're really uh, able to uh, monitor the strength of these franchises uh, and also know which title in the franchise is the most powerful and where, in which territory. That really helps us. And finally, it combines the ability to track measurable viewership with the intangible ripple effect uh, or velocity associated with the show. And luckily, with the addition of YouGov Stream, we are going to be able to get a much more complete picture of the performance of our titles globally. So back to you, Ali. Thank you, Francois. And I'm so impressed by all your memory of all those numbers. I'm just like <laughs> constantly impressed by you. Um, so yeah, so as Francois points out, the real vision of this product is to give our clients this complete picture. And it's not just about social, it's about linking that back to the thousands of variables we track on our panelists in order to provide you even more segmented profiling audience information. So not only do we have signal, but now we have scaled SVOD viewership to give you that. Moreover, when you're actually looking at the data through time on the platform, you can use the track tool in order to benchmark this data through time against competitors. You can see um, year over year the, the transition or the growth of viewership through time. As friends Swab pointed out in the beginning, you know, the loss of not being able to see that incremental growth from season one when you launch season four, that's what you'll be able to capture with this cross-platform streaming viewership. So what you're looking at is the launch of a particular show, Peaky Blinders, way in the beginning versus uh, its third season and, and the growth of that viewership through time, and then also getting daily viewership in order to see that shift. The second thing we're giving our clients is a viewership overview page, which provides more in-depth information about who is watching the show, what other things they're watching, and how you might be able to capture their uh, attention with perhaps subsequent seasons or additional content. So not only we're capturing the overall viewership reach, but also demographic information that is the information collected from YouGov survey data. Over here is the viewership data the display of how we're going to show the different demographic information. And again, viewership reach, we intend to be a um, metric that you can then compare different shows against on our all page. So again, this, this sort of tracking of the qual and the quant all at once is why we think this product is so valuable to a lot of our clients. As Francois pointed out earlier, there's that velocity of a and the talkability of a show that everyone talks about when um, when a show is, is very successful. So here in this graph, you can sort of see viewership is the purple line. So that obviously grows tremendously when a show is dropped, 
But you can also see as social is uh, as social plays into the sort of overall viewpoint of the show, those, those are further data points that for someone like Francois can use to show what groups of individuals this is resonating with. Not only that, but we also offer our clients the ability to deep dive into the conversation being had about that show during those peaks and valleys to read the social data. Being able to actually get that cross-platform is another vision of this product, of course. So being able to say, show me the Netflix viewership data versus show me uh, the Paramount Plus viewership data, Francois can actually view what was the performance of NCIS on Netflix versus uh, on Paramount Plus. So I know everyone wants to know about roadmap. So uh, we thought we'd, we'd um, end the presentation here where we really wanna show you how fast we're moving with this product and how we plan to roll out tons of sources in the coming months. Um, and essentially by the end of phase four, we will be um, across all the major platforms and all the major geos that um, our clients are really looking for. So right now, what's available and launching at the end of this month, which is very soon, um, and clients like our lovely Francois will get access to this data, um, is UK and US Netflix data, demographic overview page. Subsequently, we will be adding all these other data sources. Plus, the vision of this product is to then, once we've added the traditional sources, to go more into locally driven sources. So for example, Globo Play is incredibly important for LATAM and um, our clients uh, at Sony, I know love that, love having data that, in that market. So adding those more locally driven um, data sources is really important to this product as well. So at that, I'm going to pause and um, answer any questions anyone may have. I do have uh, one burning question for Francois since he is um, the purveyor of all content, but um, okay. So let me look through some of these comments. I do see there was a question of does YouGov stream collect data on desktop only or does it include mobile and CTV? The answer is yes, we track data based on the account based to that profile. So we can actually see the viewership across all devices. So cross platform device. So if I watch a TV show on um, my profile here at home or in my car or um, in another setting where I've logged into my profile, it's going to capture that viewership and it's for my individual profile. It isn't going to collect viewership of anyone else in my household because my profile is linked directly to me. And I am also a YouGov panelist who has given this product number of, uh, or has given YouGov a number of um, survey responses about who I am and what I do. Okay, so I do have a question for Francois. Um, I want to know, since, since you are, you watch a lot of TV, let's be honest. Um, I want to know what is your favorite scripted and unscripted, uh, particularly in linear and streaming. But then I also want to know your all time unscripted show. All right, so how long do you have? <laughs> so I think the best scripted show that has ever, be, ever been made uh, is The Good Wife. I think it's brilliant, it's smart, it's incredible, it's funny. It's really, really an incredible show. And if you haven't watched it, you can uh, catch up on it on Paramount Plus. A very, very good show. On, um, on streaming, um, I'm a big consumer of HBO Max. I think it's a great platform. So I love all of their originals. I love, love, love life, uh, industry, search party. Um, I have very, very girly taste. Uh, and I also love uh, The Great on Hulu. Uh, and when it comes to uh, Unscripted, Obviously, my biggest TV treasure is RuPaul's Drag Race. Uh, who isn't in love with that show? It's the best show in the world. It's the most entertaining, the most touching. It's funny and it's fabulous. Uh, if you haven't watched it, it's going to change your life. And right now, there's adaptations of that show all over the world, and they're all 100% pure joy. Oh, and I also watch all the uh, Real Housewives, all of them religiously. Uh, I'm a big, big fan of the Real Housewives. Amazing. Uh, well, that's all we have for you today, everyone. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, again, if you have any questions, I'm just going to um, put my email up here. Um, and if you'd like to reach out and ask any questions about YouGov Stream, please feel free to, um, even YouGov Safe as well, 
Uh, we'd love to work on a bespoke project with you. Again, Francois, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank and thank you. you everyone for attending. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.